Today I'm speaking with Rachel Kovacini, author of The Man on the Buckskin Horse, releasing this week in standalone form. I'm really excited about that. So Rachel, tell us a bit about the book and its evolution to this exciting time of publication. Um, well, uh, I wrote the first draft of Man on the Buckskin Horse in 2015, which feels like a very long time ago now. Um, and I wrote it because I wanted to enter it in a, a contest um, for retellings of Sleeping Beauty. So um, I wrote this, I actually wrote the original, the original version of it from the perspective of the gunfighter, the man on the, the buckskin horse, like him coming to town and getting embroiled in this whole situation. He doesn't have any idea what's going on and ending up like solving some problems for some people. Um, and I gave it to my my writing mentor and she said, this is a really fun idea, but it's very boring Aww. because we have so many books about gunfighters who have, you know, who who discover they still have kindness or who mm -hmm. have a kind heart, but they're they're going down this this violent path and decide to turn from that. She's like, we, we have thousands of books like that, what, but we don't have a lot of, of books about like sheep ranchers or midwives or she's like choose one of the side care one of the other characters and and try just retelling it from a different character's perspective um so i did um and uh, i will admit i was a bit piqued by the fact that she did very bluntly tell me this is boring oh. uh, <laughs> so i could just kind of set out to prove like okay if that was boring let me write something unboring and so I rewrote the whole thing from the midwife's perspective. She's kind of the the fairy godmother, the good fairy godmother from Sleeping Beauty. And like, just was like, that was boring. Let me be unboring. And this version was was the result or the first the first version of what became this was the result. Um, and that's what I submitted to the, the contest then. And it won the contest in 2016, got published in the anthology Five Magic Spindles um which was just super exciting and the the editors of that then I did a lot of like rewriting of the story for them they wanted to change the title it wasn't originally called man on the buckskin horse and they wanted to add some more like I don't want to say stereotypical but some some things that you would expect from a western because they had never had a western in one of their anthologies and they're like this is going to be weird people aren't going to expect this there's no magic in this story. They're like, so people are going to be like, oh, it's a Western. What are they going to expect from that? They're going to expect there's like a gunfight or some kind of physical altercation at the end. So like I reworked the whole ending to have this, this showdown at the end kind of thing, mm -hmm. because they were like, we really want, we really want to meet expectations with that. Um, but yeah, then it was, it was published in 2016 and they had exclusive publication rights for five years. And then the agreement was then now they have non-exclusive publication rights so they can go on printing and selling their version in, in Five Magic Spindles. But the final version that I, I uh, submitted to them, the rights to that reverted to me and then I could sell it on my own if I want to. So that's what I'm doing now. Very exciting. I really like that uh, fairy godmother as a midwife that's uh, really very creative and certainly brings out an important historical character. Yes, I think I had just, I had recently read a book um, just kind of about the role of midwives in, in pioneer life and pioneer world. And that quite often they would be the only person in a small community who had any kind of like medical knowledge at all and that really just fascinated me like what, what what would it be like if you were you were a midwife so really what you knew how to do was deliver babies and help moms but you were also the only person with any kind of nursing experience to deal with any other kind of ailments or illnesses or injuries or anything like that and then I started you know like researching more into that as I wrote it but I was noticing again that she was five feet, one inches tall in your story, which uh, is just a, a little tiny powerhouse. So yeah. that kind yeah. of feeds into that fairy idea too. Right. Um, kind of reminds me of my grandmother. I think she was about that size and maybe people were a little bit smaller historically too. So that's 
another kind of cool detail that, you know, there's always details to pull out of stories like that. But that kind of segues into um, the Sleeping Beauty you mentioned was what the contest was. So I guess that's why you chose that as your first retelling. But did was that what sort of got you into retelling fairy tales? Or did you have that idea before that? Um, I did actually have the idea a couple of years earlier. Um, I was starting to write my first like full length Western and I was just loving it. And I was thinking about like, what are, what are popular things going on in the publishing world right now that I could try to incorporate with the Westerns just, just to maybe find a, a sub genre that I could, could make work. And I had actually thought somewhere around like 2014, like it would be really fun to retell 12 dancing princesses as mm -hmm. a Western because you you have Twelve Dancing Princesses. It's about a soldier coming home from the wars who has a lot of skills, but he has no money, and he's just kind of wandering the country. And then he meets up with someone who gives him, you know, a magic cloak and and some good advice. And he uses his his smarts and his magic cloak to solve this problem and win the hand of a princess. And it just struck me that you know, so much of the West was opened up by Civil War veterans who had trauma and had things they needed to work through after the Civil War and went west and said, I, I have room, I have space, I have time, I can, you know, I can, I can wander and I can roam and work through these, these repercussions of having been in this war. How easily does that fit with this soldier who's coming home from the war from the in the fairy tale and that that would be really fun. And I actually had kind of this idea of I could could have like a, a fairy tale detective, but who's also like a Civil War veteran who was like solving all these different fairy tale things. But I never really went anywhere that obviously eventually that original idea with with 12 Dancing Princesses became um, my standalone book Dancing in Donuts, but that was that was the first time I was like, you know, I, th I think a Western and a fairy tale would work. I, I really think they would. So when the the storytelling contest came up, I was like, oh, I, I have already had an idea that you could do fairy tales and Westerns kind of blended. Let's see if I could make that happen. So I know you love Western, I but tell me how that evolved in, in your life. Like, what is it about Western stories that, that you love and how did that kind of come about? Um. Part of it, I think, is just that there are a lot of horses in Western movies. And when I was very small, um, when I was two, my parents took me to the theater as a special treat. And we went to see The um, the Man from Snowy River, oh. and, which is all about horses. And it's, it's Australian, but it's a Western, and it's all about horses. And I just fell in love with horses so hard at the age of two. And then we, when I was like four or five, we moved to a place where they they had actually um, video rental stores. Those were just becoming a thing in the mid eighties. And so my parents and my parents got a TV for the first time. We moved, we moved the new congregation my dad was serving, gave us a TV as a welcome present oh. we had a TV. So we could go to the town and we could rent a VCR and a videotape like as a special treat once a month or so. And the first movie my parents rented was The Man from Snowy River because I had loved it so much when I was little. And then from then on, it was just like anytime they would rent rent a VCR and a movie, let's see if we could find a Western, let's find something with the, the kind of feeds that. Because my dad grew up watching cowboy shows and cowboy movies. And so he kind of had a memory of, oh, I know this John Wayne movie will be fine to watch with my kids. You know, oh, I, I know this, this you know, James Garner Western is going to be fine. So we just kind of naturally watched a lot of Westerns when I was growing up. And that just became kind of my thing. Plus, I did take some like horse riding lessons and went to a couple of horse camps and things like that because I was I was really into them. Read a lot of Marguerite Henry books. Um, mm -hmm. And that just kind of fed my love of of the old west and then when i got in, very into history that was like oh well of course i'm going to learn a lot about that era because i'm already interested in it that's really cool i love hearing about that uh how your childhood impacted that um so do you have any favorite western towns that inspire stories maybe places you've visited or even even towns that are kind of modeled in any of your books um 
I have not modeled any towns in any of my books on a specific place or use real places. One of my short stories talks about um, a town called Alita, Kansas, which was a real place. Um, you cannot go there today. Unfortunately, it is entirely underwater um, because they flooded the valley to make a lake because they dammed up a river um, sometime in the early 19, like 1920s, something like that. But it was a real place. Um, and there are actually a few maps and like photographs of it from when it was a real town. That's the only one I've really, really used as a real place. Um, but I have definitely modeled things on real places. Um, the towns of Creed, Colorado, and Bodie, Colorado are both mining towns that were actually, both of them still have some like ghost town stuff and you can still go. Bodie actually is a, still a town, but Creed is mostly a ghost town. And they had some history and some, some um, topography that worked well when I was writing my rock and my refuge. So I did kind of draw on both of those. Um, but places that I've been in real life, I mean, I've been, I've been to, to Wyoming and I've been to Colorado and places like that, but I talk about Cheyenne, I guess, in, in Cloaked a little bit, but we don't really spend much time there. Um, and I've, I've been to Cheyenne. I have relatives who live there, but just the general, just the general world of the West is, is a lot of, it's a lot of inspiration, I guess, to me, just the fact that you can, you can tell so many different stories there. You can tell a, a gold mining story and you can tell a, a plains farmer's story and th it, there's, there's so much variety. Very good. So going back to the, the current story, um, which is your favorite character and why? Um, probably a tie between uh, Emma, the midwife, and Luke Palmer, the gunman, and also um, Victor, who's the, the father of, of the Sleeping Beauty. Um, and I love all three of them a lot for different reasons. Like Emma is very kind and plain spoken like she's she's nice but she also just tells you what she thinks if mm -hmm. she's not pleased with something she's going to tell you that uh which is something I'm not always so I I kind of value that in her because sometimes I wish that I would have that that chutzpah to to speak up like she does um and I love Luke because Luke Palmer is troubled and running away from a lot of things but eventually he does have the courage to to just stop running and say I, I'm done I'm I'm done with that which is hard to do any any anytime you start to run away from your past or anything else the stopping is the hardest part um and Victor's just really sweet like like I could marry Victor Victor's just the nicest dad and 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 loveliest sort of calm person and I like calm people <laughs> <laughs> very good well there's a lot of contrast between those three characters so that's fun to hear about them do you have uh, any way that you in particular choose your characters names I mean do you look for historical names do you ask people to help you with that or how do you decide I mean you've written a lot of books now how do you keep coming up with names um, depends on the character. Some characters come to me with their name and that is their name. And I can't, you know, some, sometimes I have to change character names, but like, I think Emma was, Emma was just her name. Um, I did find her, her last name I found in a book of British Isles surnames. Um, and I liked that Thornberry is like, she's prickly, but she's also sweet. Like that's, that's her in a nutshell right there. So I loved that. Um, Victor is actually, he's named after my favorite actor or one of my favorite actors, Vic Morrow, who I just was like, I love that name. I want to kind of honor him, use that name there. Um, but I, I will go through lists of like popular baby names in the year that this character would have been born. You know, like what, what were the popular baby names from the 18... 1800 early 1800s you know 1800 1820 or whatever and can I find something that works there that I know was 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 in use um or once in a while I will I will just 
look through if I have like an actor in mind or an actress in mind to play a character I'll look through lists of like what characters have they played what names kind of work for this person and can I use something similar to that or can I use one of those um but yeah some actors some some, some characters just come to you Jakob Beckman in my rock and my refuge he was like my name is Jakob and I'm like well that's that's nice but I just I just wrote a character named Jacob in One Bad Apple, so I'm sorry, you can't be named Jacob. And I spent like weeks trying uh -huh. to find a different name for him. But he would not have it. His his name was Jacob and that was it. And I was finally, I was like, well, it's spelled differently and it's pronounced differently. Anybody who knows a little German is going to know it's not Jacob. So, right. okay, fine. Your name is Jacob. Go, go have fun. Um, but other ones, like sometimes, sometimes names too will be very meaningful. Um, Marta in My Rock and My Refuge, mm -hmm. she's very much like a Martha character from the Bible where she always wants to be busy and she always wants to be doing and to be helping and to be serving. And so I kind of pulled on that for her. Um, and sometimes like Beckman is a German last name for bakers. So that makes sense that that would be their last name. Um, in Cloaked, the character Hauer power literally means woodcutter so it was like that's his role in the little red riding hood story i will just give him a last name that means that but that's really cool that's that's a fun backstory to hear about that <laughs> i hadn't thought about thornberry that's that's meaningful i really enjoy hearing about yeah. luke palmer oh. too a palmer is a pilgrim and okay. somebody who's on a pilgrimage, who's on a, you know, a quest to to find grace or find peace or something. And oh. that's that's his his life. Sounds like maybe you need a new article to to share some <laughs> of these cool things, because that really does add a lot of depth to know that. It's very fun. So how about faith? I mean, you are you write Christian historic historical Western fairy tale fiction. So there's a lot packed in there, but I mean, I know you're a woman of faith and how does that come out in the stories that you write? Um, I think that every author, their worldview is going to come out in their fiction, whether they, whether they acknowledge it at all. I mean, J.R.R. Tolkien did not set out to write a Catholic fantasy, Roman Catholic fantasy book, but if you look at Lord of the Rings and you know anything about Roman Catholicism, it's it's everywhere. It's 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 it permeates what he wrote. And I think for any any writer, you know, when you have a writer who is a um outspoken atheist like um George R. R. Martin, his whole books are very bleak and very there's there's no meaning. It's very meaningless. And did he do that on purpose? Maybe, maybe not. Is it, you know, is it just the reflection of his worldview? So I think if you are a Christian writer, your books are going to be Christian. If you're a Jewish writer, your books are going to have d your Jewish faith in them, whether you put it there specifically or not. Um, I do try, though, to write, quote unquote, Christian fiction. Um, so I do sometimes more explicitly than others include faith in in the books. Um, but I try to do it in a way that that is is kind of natural, like this is a book about people who are already Christians and just going about their everyday life. And in my everyday life, do I pray throughout the day? Yes, I do. Do I pray out loud? Sometimes, but not all, no, you know, not, not that often. Do I pray before meals? Yes, I do. Do I go to church on Sunday? Yes, I do. Do I read my Bible? Yes. Do I, you know, have long, deep theological discussions with people once in a while, but not you know, over every little thing. So a lot of my books, I have gotten reviews saying, how is this Christian fiction? There's no, the word, the name of Jesus is never used. And I've had other people review exactly the same book saying there's too much God stuff in this book. I didn't like it. And I'm like, okay, this is the same book. Right. How, how are you, <laughs> you know, how are you reviewing that? Obviously, if, some people are like, there's too much God stuff in this. Obviously, the, the faith is coming through, whether I explicitly say Jesus's name or say anything, any kind of a, a um, profession of faith or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I just try to have characters who are Christians going through something. And, of course, their faith is going to impact how they react to situations. But 
is it, you know, sometimes sometimes there are long theological discussions. Uh, my Rock and My Refuge has several of those because you do have people from two different kind of faith backgrounds butting heads a little bit about what do we think about things that doesn't necessarily happen in some of the other books. So, so it sounds like that just flows out of the characters and who they are, but also, as you mentioned, your worldview right? and how that's just natural overflow into your writing. Yep. I mean, I've read a lot of Christian fiction where the characters are supposed to be Christians, but nobody ever goes to church. Nobody ever prays before meals or prays at all or reads a Bible, but there will be, you know, they'll throw in a, a conversation at some point where somebody says, well, my faith will get me through or, you know, it's like it's very, very vague. And and that bothers me a little bit. Like if this is supposed to be about Christian characters, they should be walking in a Christian life, whether or not they're, you know, preaching at people. So it has to be a little bit interesting, though, writing Westerns, you know, where maybe every town didn't have a church. And I right. remember that from some of your other books, you know, just like trying to get a church established or the saloon is doubling as the church. You know, I mean, it's just where. Right. Where, or we have a know. church, but it's also the schoolhouse. And we have mm -hmm. a, you know, you might have a circuit rider who comes through once a month or once every two months. And and how do you do that? You it In some ways, it, it was in a more overtly religious world but in other ways it was not i mean church going in like the 1890s the percentage of people who were regular church goers was a not that much different than now and so we think of oh everybody in the on the prairie was like you know like little house on the prairie and everybody goes to church and everybody sings shall we gather at the river and of course they did not necessarily right um, some people, yes, in some communities, yes, but not not everywhere. So, interesting. So, does this story tie to any particular events in history? I mean, I think you mentioned Civil War a little bit, right? So, obviously, the Civil War is in the background. This is um, 1869, so four years and change after the Civil War ended, um, and the man on the buckskin horse himself is a Civil War veteran. Um, and presumably some other people in the community are. Emma talks about other other former soldiers coming through and also that they would not stay around. This is where our concept of like the the lone gunfighter in cowboy movies, that's where it comes from. You had you had former soldiers who could not settle down after the war and went west looking for peace or looking for space to roam. And it seemed to have worked after about four or five years, veterans just started settling down. They seemed to have worked through their PTSD or shell shock or whatever they had and were ready to, to get married, settle down, start a, a stable life. Um, so I kind of work through that in a lot of my books. That that shows up over and over and over again. Again, in in Germany in eighteen, um, the War of eighteen seventy, the Franco Prussian War. After the war, we got this huge influx of young German immigrant men in the United States because they came home from that war and said, "I can't be here right now. I can't just be at home and be normal again. I need to." go somewhere else and the united states said oh we've got all this space that just opened up in the middle of the country want to come farm and so they did um yeah so those kind of like larger world events quite often play a little bit into my books here and there um there are no specific like real people in this book who were real people in history that are named there is a sheriff who comes down from lincoln toward the end and i at one point in an earlier draft, I did name him. There was a sheriff from Lincoln that I just used his name. And then in, in later drafts, I was like, he's he, he doesn't even have any lines, really. I don't need him to have a name. Um, so I pulled his name out. But he would be a, a real person who could have actually come and done this. Very cool. Um, how about themes in this in this book? The man in the buckskin horse. What What would you say are the primary themes you hope your readers will take away? Um, that small actions can have big consequences. 
just and and in many different small actions have many different consequences in the book too whether it's a small action of trying to protect someone and accidentally causing them harm to the small action of saying i'm going to believe you and i'm going to trust that you're you're telling me the truth and something happens from that or the small action of saying you're telling me a lie and i'm not going to believe you and i'm no longer going to have dealings with you and then how is that going to going to change things um yeah, so that's that's like the huge theme of the book is just one small action. You might not even realize how important it is. It could could cause cause big differences for other people and for you. Very fun. So what's next? This book is coming out now. I'm sure you've got other things in the pipeline, Rachel. What else are I you? Have too on? many things in the pipeline. <laughs> this year is this year it was not supposed to be this crazy, but this year is crazy. What, are, um, what so, are you excited about? What's coming? <laughs> it's crazy in a good way. Um, so right now I'm working on um, a short story compilation for all of the, I've been writing little short stories that go with the whole series. Um, and I had been like kind of releasing them one a year, one or, or one or two a year. Um, several of them were available on Amazon. I've pulled most of them. There are two still available on Amazon just as free short stories. But um, and pulling those there were there were five of those that I wrote originally plus then I wrote a couple more that people on my um author newsletter have read too so there's seven there were seven stories that I had written that are like either prequels or sequels to the books in this series and I'm adding three more that are brand new so I will have 10 short stories I'm oh. going to put them out in one volume I hopefully August I don't have a date set yet because I haven't finished writing those three stories yet um <laughs> but hopefully in august um i think it's going to be called prairie tales and oh. yes and pr probably prairie tales volume one because i'm going to assume that i cannot stop writing short stories about these books and that i will eventually have a volume two um so that's coming next in august i hope and then i'm also working on an unrelated that has nothing to do with this series um book for a multi-author series called the Cornerstone series, which is a series of fairy tale retellings, non-magical Christian worldview fairy tale retellings. Um, and I am doing The Ugly Duckling. So that's been kind of fun to just to retell a fairy tale still, but not be part of this this series exactly. Um, it is still a Western though. Okay, it, I was gonna ask. <laughs> yes, it's set in like um a slightly fantasy version of early 1800s Spanish California. So oh. like the world of Zorro, that kind mm -hmm. of era, um, but with dragons and talking animals. So that's been interesting because I don't usually write fantasy. Uh, and that's called A Noble Companion and it should be releasing November 12th. I love that. Yes. And also at the same time as all of that, uh, I'm working with... Um, one audiobooks to create audiobooks of my Once Upon a Western series. Um, so behind the scenes, I'm all constantly answering questions about like pronunciation of names and just all this different stuff. So those should start appearing maybe around Christmas time, maybe after the first of next year. It's there's no set release dates yet, but but they're started recording them, so that's exciting. That's really wonderful. So many great projects. Can't wait to have years ahead. And next year, I'm just going to collapse and have a nervous breakdown <laughs> and, and not write anything for, you know, like two months. But well, it's good to have a rest, too, for sure. <laughs> so show us the book cover again. OK, here's the book cover. The Man on the Buckskin Horse. Yes, and... and it tells you illustrated edition because it has lot has well, not lot. It has some illustrations in it and I'm gonna see if I can find you my favorite one because he's so cool where is he he's also on the mug I was just drinking out of oh know. there he is, is. But the there man is. yep the man on the horse very yes. good yes and available Amazon and available on Amazon, books are sold <laughs> uh, as of April 30th it should be in paperback and um and ebook and then 
shortly after that, Barnes & Noble will pick it up and you'll be able to get the paperback from them. And then um, it will be available for Nook too within a week or so, however long it takes them to kind of flip 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 the 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 formatting and make it work for them so well fantastic thank you for taking the time to talk over some of the parts of your book today i'm really excited for the release and trusting that it will be very successful along with your other books so happy to to share the time about it yes, yeah this has been very good. very fun